so uh, we had started last week, but I thought I would start over again, especially since I deleted the part that, that of the reenactment of the uh, gospel from from our video. So part of the what what Jesus is trying to teach the disciples here and therefore trying to teach us concerns the way in which we understand and the way in which we use scripture. So that really starts with the Pharisees. Well, it really starts with with the uh, feeding of the 4,000, which is, uh, uh, we can call it a pre-enactment of the heavenly banquet. It's based on uh, the heavenly banquet in Isaiah 25 and really acts out the heavenly banquet so that it points forward to the heavenly banquet as it will be celebrated in heaven. And as hopefully we pray, God willing, we ourselves can participate in the heavenly banquet in the fullness of time. Then continues when the Pharisees demand a sign. And uh, Jesus responds by saying that no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah, which is a forward looking sign. So in some sense, that's not really an answer at all, but he calls them a rude uh, uh, and adulterous generation. And um, the significant thing about that is that they're looking for a literal sign because the Bible attaches these apparently literal signs to the day of the Lord. The sun will be darkened, and there will be earthquakes, things will shake, the moon will be darkened, there won't be light. And so those are presumably, presumably from the viewpoint of the Pharisees, the signs attendant on the day of the Lord. But Jesus, in fact, is, is implicitly saying that those aren't the signs at all, those are merely symbols. And the real sign, if we read the prophets, is that the day of the Lord comes in a period of great idolatry when the Lord intervenes into history to save his remnant, those who have remained faithful to God, those who have continued to worship God in the face of idolatry. And so the Pharisees are the sign because they're idolatrous. They're not necessarily idolatrous in the sense that they're worshiping other gods, but they're idolatrous in the sense that they've really forgotten about God. And so in the process, their understanding of scripture has become in many ways distorted. Then in the teaching on divorce, we see that once again with uh, the Pharisees focusing on the, 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 the verse that's relevant to them, the, uh, the bill of divorce that Moses says you can give your wife to end the marriage. So that's, you know, very literal and you select the verse of scripture that's relevant to you. And that, you know, works great if you're a man, it's like just a wonderful thing. And uh, in contrast to that, Jesus asked the question of what is the heart of God? And so instead of looking at the bill of divorce, you know, the, from Moses, he looks at Genesis and the creation story and why are there men and why are there women and why do they unite to become one flesh? So that's the heart of God. Then we have the rich young man who's searching for the one thing or the limited set of things that will give him eternal life. And Jesus starts practically with, with the Decalogue, in fact, mm -hmm. with the second half of the Decalogue, but then adds uh, loving your Lord, your God, with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, loving your neighbor as yourself, which are much more abstract and much harder. And then selling all of his possessions and giving them to the poor, which the man is unwilling to do. So 
uh, we move from a very literal interpretation of scripture to again going to what is the heart of God? What is the overall meaning of scripture? And so one of the things that's really striking here is that in many ways, the disciples are uh, hearing Jesus very selectively. So what I thought we would do is read from Matthew, read what Jesus says, and then I'll read a rendition of what I think the disciples heard. So why don't we start with Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 24 through 28. Who would like to read them? I'll start out. Okay. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, what do the disciples hear? I think this is what they hear. For the Son of Man is to come with the angels in the glory of his Father. Truly, I tell you, there's some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So they're not hearing the lesson. <laughs> they're not hearing the lesson. So they're specifically not hearing anything about denying themselves. They're not hearing anything about taking up the cross and following me. They're not hearing anything about saving their life. Those who save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And so their, their goal is to gain the whole world, <laughs> which, which is what you need to do if you want to forfeit your life. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So so on the one hand, that, that seems, you know, funny but on the other hand you know that in many ways that's that's a very tempting christian message and and one i mean the the disciples rendition of it is a very tempting christian message and one in which to a degree i think probably all of us are inclined to at least believe or want and for some groups it's what theologically is taught, right? That that because you're a follower of of God uh, and God is all powerful, then somehow that power has has uh, trickled down to you. It's kind of a you know sort of trickle down theory, and so all things are possible through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So. You know, we can climb mountains, we can run marathons, we can uh, accomplish the impossible. Never mind that when Paul says that all things are possible through Christ Jesus, who strengthens us, he's very much in keeping with Jesus, the, the, what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about he can endure all suffering. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about he can, you know, do these incredible acts of volunteerism and uh, become superhuman. He's saying that he can suffer. So, um, a very different message. Are there any any thoughts or comments here? It's 
And of course, the ones that are, are going to taste death are not them. It might be one of the other people, but not themselves, right? Right. 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 Eternity is guaranteed for them because they're disciples of the Messiah. So then let's take a look. Matthew chapter 17, verses 9 through 12. Who wants to read them? As, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He replied, Elijah does come, and he is to restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they please. So the Son of Man will suffer at their hands. Uh, did you say in the last one? Then yeah. the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. So what the disciples heard is, well, or the, the, the version with the disciples being cognitive is, and the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah, as they were going down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one about the vision. And the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So they've cut out the part about the Son of Man being raised from the dead. They don't want to do that. And, and they're also, and then also we, we've discussed this. This is another case of a conflict in the understanding of Scripture that the disciples expect a literal Elijah based on the prophecy in Malachi. So they're looking as, at prophetic fulfillment as being something that's literal. And Jesus is arguing that the scripture has already been fulfilled, that there isn't a literal Elijah coming, but instead that, that uh, Elijah has already come because the fulfillment is typological, not literal. And uh, the, the type of Elijah was John the Baptist who was killed. So... The disciples uh, and the disciples understand that, so they've moved from from uh, a very literal understanding to a somewhat literal understanding. They know what happened to John the Baptist. They know that John the Baptist existed, and Jesus has told them that that prophecy has been fulfilled. But they shut out the rest. They've shut out the part about his his uh, rising from the dead. I'm not sure they really understand that the prophecy has been fulfilled either. And I don't because think they think of Jesus as the Son of Man, right? Well, they, they, or do they? I think they think of him as the Messiah. They think of him as glorious. But they, they understand that. I think that they understand, you know, so we've read Daniel chapter 7. A number of, of times repeatedly actually mm -hmm. but i think that they understand the coming of the son of man as being so in daniel's prophecy the son of man is presented before god the father so it's not an earthly vision of glory it, it, the, the 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 rough equivalent is in in you know the the tradition of the church is that jesus takes his place at the right hand of the Father. That's the, the Son of Man being presented to the ancient days. Uh, but instead of that, I think the disciples understand that as you know, Jesus coming here to earth in glory. 
and and in fact that's how mm -hmm. uh, you know many of our separated brethren particularly pre-millennial dispensationalists understand it the, the, the son of man comes to earth in glory that, that you know represents the second coming in in pre-millennial dispensational interpretation so so it's uh it's very partial and here in the case of it's a flawed understanding of scripture on the part of the disciples and it's it's a a, a um well, it, it from from their perspective, it ignores the fact the part that Jesus is going to be raised has to die, and will be raised from the dead. So we were uh, we were uh, reading from some of the things that Jesus said, and I was giving a, a an enactment of what I think the disciples understood. Which is difficult, which is different than, uh, or partial, uh, a partial excerpt from what Jesus said, so that they, you know, fundamentally missed the point, and and heard something that was uh, uh, not quite that, that didn't preserve the spirit of what Jesus was saying. Particularly, they they cut out the parts about his death and, and resurrection cut out the parts about whoever wants to save their life will lose it they cut out the fact that jesus is calling his disciples to be a people of sacrifice that they're to carry their crosses take up their crosses, just as he took up his cross and they're cutting out the part about uh the son of man dying and therefore being raised from the dead so we're up to Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. 17? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some stuff on YouTube about 20. What happened? Well, well here's the thing. Are we going backward again? I'm just like... <laughs> Exactly. I, I was thinking we would go back to one, to one, but there was just too much resistance. No, actually, to, to seriously answer your question, chapters 16 through 20 are you know, an integrated whole. We tend to approach them as separate chapters or even separate sections within the chapter or separate um verses within a particular episode but in some sense they're they're integrated they're all jesus attempts to uh in all all of those chapters jesus is attempting to teach the disciples the meaning of discipleship what it means to be a disciple of jesus he's also attempting to teach them how we are to understand scripture and in all of these cases they're 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 having difficulty internalized they're having difficulty hearing they're you know very much like men with selective hearing they're jesus is talking but they're hearing what they want to hear and the parts that they're prepared to understand and they're not you know getting very far and they're struggling so they miss the part about self-sacrifice they don't you know really aren't very interested in doing that they're concerned with the glory of the messiah but they don't very much like peter when when he uh when he rebukes jesus they're they're not very enthusiastic about the death of the messiah they don't understand why the messiah has to die when the messiah is supposed to be glorious so, you know, I thought we would look at, you know, some of the, the key things that Jesus said and the, the way in which the disciples uh, misunderstood and misinterpreted it, since in many ways, I think those misinterpretations, in fact, continue to be very common today and for us are very appealing. 
Um, you know, so for example, self-sacrifice that we should take up our cross. Who wants to take up their cross? Who wants to be called to sacrifice? Most of us don't. We would prefer that it not be that way. Um, and then the 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 lessons about how to understand scripture are also really important because uh, it's really calling us and Matthew is calling us to to you know, sort of look at for the heart of God, look at the broader meaning of scripture and don't focus on these individual verses, least of all the, the verses that you find convenient for yourself. And so the bill of divorce from Moses is you know, really good for men. Without it, you know, Peter asks, why do we bother to get married? If you can't get divorced easily, it may not be worth it. So look, you know, one approach to scripture is we look for the verses that please us and that that are comforting to us, and that is fundamentally flawed. So we're up to, let's see, chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Who would like to read them? Actually, 22 and 23, 22 through 27. I'll do it. <laughs> As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the half-scale tax went up to J Peter and said, Does not your teacher pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came home, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of earth take toll or tribute? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find, is it scale, scale? Shekel. Shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So what did Peter hear or they hear? As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into human hands. And on the third day, he will be raised. And they were greatly distressed. So they've missed, they will kill him. And then when he came home with the temple tax thing, and when he came home, Jesus spoke a bit first saying, what do you think, Simon? From who do earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? Um, when Peter said from others, Jesus said to him, then the children are free. So two things in, in this section. One is that the killing him is missed and the focus is on the third day being raised. And then uh, in terms of the temple tax, Jesus is saying that on the one hand, as the children of God, we're not obligated to pay the temple tax because it's the subjects and not the children who have to pay the tax. But on the other hand, that will give offense and that will be an expression of non-solidarity with other Jews who worship at the temple, pay the temple tax and take it seriously. So not paying is a statement that you're not really part of them, that they're the other and you're privileged 
and Jesus doesn't find that acceptable, even though you don't have to pay the temple tax, even though it's not an obligation, you have to do it as an expression of solidarity and a, with other people. But Peter, in all probability, doesn't hear that. And the disciples at this point certainly don't hear uh, a great deal about uh, suffering. The next we have Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. Who would like to read that? He answered, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Here, for your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives but from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a divorced woman can, commits adultery. So the disciples take in very little of this. What they understand is that God does not condone divorce except in rare cases, right? And then the disciples ask Jesus, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. So they go back to, to the, their approach is very much the same as the Pharisees and the bill of divorce. The, the, it's you know, right there in scripture, it says that Moses commanded a man to give his wife a bill of divorce in order to divorce her. So that's the law of Moses. That the law of Moses comes from God. That's what scripture says. That's, you know, that's that's the relevant portion of scripture. And so the understanding is very literal and very self-serving. So we see that all the time self-serving use of scripture. Remember also a while ago, we read the blessings in Deuteronomy. And, and so the, you know, the, the scriptural citation that included the blessings didn't include the curses. Mm -hmm. There are blessings and there are curses. You can't take the blessings without the curses. They're integrally related. You can't select the portion of scripture that you like. You can't select the proportion of scripture that makes you feel good. You can't select the portion of scripture that, quote, speaks to you, unquote. You have to look for at scripture as a whole. You have to look at the heart of God. You have to look at the meaning of scripture. And scripture has to be interpreted. So here Jesus looks at what is God's intent in creating marriage. It has ultimately nothing to do with the bill of divorce. And it has nothing to do with being self-serving. It has to do with marriage being a reflection of, of uh, the unity of the Trinity, that, that there are three in one and similarly in marriage. There are two people who become one flesh. So next we have Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. Well, actually we can read 
uh, everything from 23 to 30. Who would like to read? Well, I'll take it. 24 to 30 on chapter 19. Uh-huh. 23 to 30. 23. There you go. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. But when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man shall sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many that are first will be last, and the last are first. <clears throat> so when Jesus says it will be hard for a rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, the disciples don't exactly take in the message. But what they hear Jesus saying, which is shocking, is that the rich, whom God has chosen to bless with abundance, are unlikely to inherit eternal life, which is shocking because after all, you know, you kind of want to be rich, right? And God's blessed these people. And what's, what's the story here? He's now evidently not going to reward them with eternal life. It's, it's, that doesn't seem exactly fair. Um, and so then the disciples ask, then who can be saved? Because obviously if God is blessing the rich and isn't giving them eternal life. Uh, We're worthless. <laughs> the, the people who God is blessing are being cursed. So in that case, everyone must be cursed. So Jesus says, for mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. What did the disciples hear? Nothing. <laughs> Instead, they're back at they're back at the rich man not inheriting eternal life, evidently, which is very disturbing, which prompts Peter to say, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What happened? What? What's in this for us? Peter's worried that they had left everything, and he's thinking if the rich man's not going to get it, not going to have a free ride into heaven, how in the world could they have one? Right. Because in in that time, because they'd the given up everything. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and then in the last part, Jesus talks about the the. Uh, um, those who have followed his, the, the, the 12 uh, apostles will sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. Then he says that whoever has left houses or brothers or father or mother or children for my name's sake uh, will in, uh, receive a hundredfold, but many who are last first will be last and the last first. So a scatological reversal. What do the disciples hear? Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so they're going to get something good out of it. They've, oh. they've given up everything and followed Jesus, but they get the 12 thrones at the renewal of things. 
<clears throat> so that's something. See how fast we're going, Thais? I see. We're yeah. see. already into 20 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One night we made, we did like I don't know four chapters. Is that correct? Yeah. Sure. Wow. Well, that's I never saw that, guys. <laughs> I, I feel like I was holding you guys. <laughs> oh. Holding you back. Good thing you didn't wait any longer. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so, besides the 12 thrones, the disciples also want greatness now, right? This is the Messiah, the Messiah is glorious, the Messiah is the Davidic king, the, the Messiah is uh, the, a holy priest, uh, the, the Messiah is a mighty warrior, there should be glory attendant with the Messiah. So they ask about who is greatest in the kingdom, right? And then when they find out that the greatest in the kingdom is the least, nevertheless, going back to the theme of the 12 thrones, they want to find out who sits at Jesus' left and who Jesus sits at Jesus' right. And they're upset that... Uh, Salome asked the question on behalf of, of, um, of John and James, but the remaining 10 disciples are upset, not because they have the chutzpah and think they're so much better than everyone. They're upset because they asked first <laughs> and they thought of it first. So they, they see this very much as an issue of earthly glory what I'm going to get now, and how God is going to bless me. So uh, we see that a great deal today. A focus on how God is going to bless me. So it becomes about us and not about God. The focus is on ourselves and what we're getting rather than the focus being on what we're giving. So questions about that? It's almost like you're hanging out with somebody just because they have a nice house and a big pool. <laughs> uh -huh. They're like, oh, they love my friend because they have that good pool and I can't swim on it. On days like yesterday, yes. I don't be their friends. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not really how it works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, even better because you're hanging out with somebody who has a big house with a big pool, they're going to buy you one as well. Exactly. Maybe a little bit smaller with a slightly smaller pool, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, you'll get your big house with a big pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You all will. Yeah. So thoughts, other other thoughts, other comments? Mm -hmm. So that leads us to the healing of the two blind men. Were you gonna stop the recording and then start it again? Yes. <laughs> 